Before we begin, I want to thank all of our newest Patreon members who are supporting the show at the $10 level and above. We got a little rock and roll theme going on at Patreon, so patrons at the $2 tier are considered classic rockers, and at the $5 tier, alternative rock gods. But at the $10 tier, you get upgraded perks and are considered pure metal. Our newest metal heads are Lizzie R, Emily F, Sammy C, Katie L, Chantel T, Nadia F, and Emily K. Thanks, you guys. Our newest $15 patrons have been placed in the OUAC VIP section. They are Christina C and Mary K. At the $20 level, our VIP all-access pass holders are Keisha S, Riley C, Ann V, and Julie P. You guys rock. I also want to give a special shout out to Dave H, who upgraded his membership from the VIP All Access $20 tier to $30, which we don't even have a tier for. Thanks, dude. We'll have to create a special designation for you. What do you think about Roadie? Or shoot me a message if you think of something even more cool. Thanks to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. If you'd like to get more information or join to receive every episode ad-free, plus bonus episodes and merch sent to you, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. In the last month alone, Patreon members have received three bonus episodes and two exclusive videos in addition to ad-free early release episodes. Once again, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to sign up. Thanks so much for supporting the show. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. In this series, I'll detail the life and crimes of Robert Garrow. Garrow began a series of killings over one month in 1973. Before his reign of terror ended, four people would be dead. The search for the suspected spree killer who'd fled into the Adirondack Mountains would be the largest manhunt conducted in New York State history. This case includes many elements of crime and justice to consider. The violent and abusive life Garrow experienced that warped him so thoroughly that he became a killer, the escalation in his life of crime from kidnap and rape to torture and murder, his ability to evade capture for 11 days while the community lived in fear, and how he was able to twist the legal system to such an extent that his defense attorneys became de facto co-conspirators. This month, I'll be giving you all the details of this incredible true crime story over two episodes. Part two will be released next week. Before I begin, I want to thank Corinne for bringing this case to my attention. It was one I'd never heard of before. I met Corinne on a train from New York to Toronto. Like strangers do on a train, we got to talking, and when she discovered I had a true crime podcast, she told me about living in fear one summer in 1973, when Robert Garrow was on the loose near her hometown in upstate New York. I had to find out more, and now I get to bring this story to you. Thank you, Corinne, and I hope you're still traveling and having more adventures and interesting conversations with strangers. This is part one of Murder Methods, Spree Killer Robert Garrow. It was late July 1973. Four friends decided to spend the weekend camping in Adirondack Park in upstate New York. Adirondack Park, containing almost 6 million acres, is the largest park in the contiguous United States. It encompasses almost one-fifth of New York State and boasts pristine forests, lakes, rivers, and hiking trails. Within its borders lies over 100 small towns, villages, and farms. The four campers, Philip Dombleski, Carolyn Malinowski, David Freeman, and Rick Riorello set up camp outside the village of Speculator, just off Old Route 8. They spent Saturday exploring area hiking trails and fishing in the lake. In the evening, they returned to the campsite and settled in for the night inside two tents. Early the next morning, an orange Volkswagen driving up Route 8 noticed the two tents in the woods that could be seen from the road. He pulled the car over, grabbed a 30 caliber rifle from the back, and walked into the woods. He first pointed the weapon at Carol Ann and David, 
who were still lying in their sleeping bags. They looked up in surprise to see a menacing figure. Robert Garrow stood at almost six feet tall and a little over 200 pounds. Pointing the rifle at them, he made them get up and march over to the second tent. Now Nick and Philip were also rounded up. When he had them all together, he directed them all to walk deeper into the woods. Garrow also had rope and a large knife that he used to cut off sections. One by one, pointing the rifle at the teens, he forced them to tie each other up to separate trees. He chose trees where they would be out of sight of one another. At first, they tried to reason with their abductor, offering him money and saying they wouldn't report him if he just left them alone. But Garrow would not be deterred from whatever grim plan he had already formed in his twisted mind. But 18-year-old Philip Domblowski must have had a premonition that this man was no mere robber, but was certainly a dangerous predator. He began to resist Garrow's insistence on tying up his friends and would not relent. Garrow began to grow more angry at the youth who would dare to defy his authority and he would make him pay. Through use of the weapon and his sheer size, Garrow was able to get all four youths tied to trees and then returned to Philip. He had tied the young man to the tree facing forward. The others, who were unable to see Philip or Garrow from where they'd been tied up, heard Philip beginning to scream. Garrow began slicing him across the chest with the large knife. Terrified and desperate to escape, the teens began to panic. Carol Ann cried out to Philip's attacker, what are you doing to him? Garrow responded calmly, It's okay, I'll be done in a minute. Just seconds later, Philip's screaming stopped. Garrow had plunged the knife deep into his chest, killing him instantly. The other two young men, Nick and David, adrenaline coursing through their bodies in sheer terror, were able to break free of their restraints and ran into the village screaming for help. Garrow fled. Minutes later, dozens of officers and community members arrived, spreading out over the woods to apprehend the killer. But it was too late. Garrow had made it back to his vehicle and disappeared into the vast wilderness of the Adirondacks. Robert Francis Garrow Jr. was born March 4, 1936, in Danamora, New York, to Robert Omer and Margaret Garrow. Robert Jr. was the second born of five children, three boys and two girls. Robert's oldest brother was not raised by his parents. It was said that he was, quote, given away at birth. To whom or under what circumstances remained a mystery, even to his siblings. A second brother died at a young age, and details of his demise are also unknown. Robert remained close to his sisters Agnes and Florence throughout his life. Robert Sr. was originally a farmer, but he took up iron ore mining when the farming industry died out in Danamora. The Garrows moved from Danamora to Mineville, a town in upstate New York near the Canadian border. Robert Jr.'s birth had occurred in the midst of the Great Depression, when poverty was rampant and jobs were scarce. Robert Garrow himself would later describe his parents as severe violent disciplinarians who regularly physically abused him. Robert Sr. drank heavily to cope with the stress and hardship of toiling in the mines for little pay. He was a violent alcoholic who often took out his frustrations on his son Robert. As abusive as Robert's father was to him, his mother Margaret was worse. Short in stature and weighing 270 pounds, she was cruel as well as violent. Robert's sisters would confirm that their brother was often a target of his mother's worst abuse. She would beat her son with belts, crowbars, and even bricks. She occasionally hit him so hard he lost consciousness. This terrified his sisters. Agnes said later in the interview, I more or less block everything from the past, closed it out of my mind. But his other sister Florence would recall, my mother hit my brother extremely hard with a piece of stove wood. I thought he was dead, and I threw some water on him. My mother used to whip him all the time. But even his sisters agreed that Robert was a, quote, incorrigible child, although it's clear why this might be true. The beatings he received, and especially the incidents of being knocked unconscious, would be very traumatic for a child. In addition, it's very possible that young Robert sustained injury to the prefrontal cortex of his brain as a result of these severe beatings. This portion of the brain is in charge of processing empathy, shame, compassion, and guilt. Injury to a child's prefrontal cortex can cause reduced impulse control and blunted emotional responses. It can also lead to increased aggressiveness, anger, and in some cases, acting out violently. 
In addition, the modeling of aggression and violence by his parents would also be a factor in his incorrigible behavior. Gero would have learned at a young age that might makes right, and the biggest, most aggressive person can exert his will over others to release frustration, gain control, or merely for sadistic pleasure. At the age of seven, Robert's parents sent him to work as a farmhand about an hour away from home. The farm was owned by the Michalik family and run by a co-worker of Robert Sr.'s named Mr. Vitasky. Robert would work for a small wage, which his mother collected each payday. He would remain at the farm until he was 15 years old. He received little formal education and had no social life. The Michalik's knew Robert had a bad home life. He once stole a pistol from the farm and bragged about wanting to shoot his parents. The farmer's family sent him home at one point for stealing jewelry, but he was eventually allowed to return. Life on the farm wasn't easy. It was characterized by hard work and discipline. According to Robert, he'd wake up at 3 a.m. to begin the day's chores, and except for meals, his work didn't end until 11 p.m. This schedule was the norm seven days a week. At the age of 10, Robert began to exhibit strange behaviors that he kept a secret from everyone. He began committing indecent acts with the farm animals. Robert spent his days and nights tending to the livestock. He was mostly alone and had little to no supervision. Due to the isolation and abuse of childhood, Robert would later say he resorted to, quote, animal companionship. In later interviews, he said, this would happen when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old, because I had no friends and I never used to play. I didn't know any children or anything. Of course, I had to fool around with cows, horses, calves, you know? Robert would later also admit to using the farm's milking machines as a masturbation tool. Quote, I never had dates, never knew anybody, he'd later say. I kept doing it for 10 years or so on other farms I worked. Robert was reportedly very shy in school and had trouble making friends. He kept his distance from the other children and was badly bullied. The kids liked to call him Cow Barn because he smelled of the farm on the days he did make it to school. He fought back one day when teased by another child, punching him in the mouth. Afterwards, his classmates only mocked him behind his back. Over time, they grew fearful of his violent outbursts. He further established his fearsome reputation by throwing one bully down the stairs and then pummeling him with his fists after he landed at the bottom in a heap. Older boys had to intervene and break up the fight. Two of Robert's classmates told author Jim Tracy, that Robert was very quiet, but polite to those who didn't bully him. His sister Florence said her brother never had any confidence with girls and didn't know how to behave normally in social situations. At the age of 15, the farm foreman, who'd been like a mentor to Robert, died. Robert was returned home to his parents shortly after, when the farm was sold. The abuse and violence continued in the Garrow home, with Robert becoming a punching bag once again. But now the teen, who had almost reached his six-foot frame, began to stand up for himself. The police were called to the home several times to break up fistfights between him and his father. The final straw came after a seemingly minor family disagreement. Robert had spent the morning picking berries so his sister Agnes could make muffins for the family. But they were out of flour, so Robert announced his intention to borrow some from a neighbor. Margaret Garrow was prideful to a fault and had a long-standing rule forbidding her children to ever, quote, ask for handouts. Robert now decided he'd had enough of his mother's control over his every move. To strike back, he went to the town justice and reported that his parents weren't feeding him. Robert's father was informed of his son's accusation, and when he returned home, they got into a fistfight. Police were called, and Robert Jr. was arrested. He was sentenced to 13 months at the State Industrial School, a correctional facility for boys in Rochester. After he completed his mandatory sentence in April of 1953, Robert was sent to live with his sister, Florence. I'm so excited because in just one week, I'll finally be traveling again. But I'm also super excited to go to the great city of London, a place I've wanted to visit for most of my life. But we all know that travel, whether just a short road trip or international, looks a little different now. So I'm looking for options to make my trip just a little bit easier and less anxiety producing. That's where Away Travel comes in. Away creates suitcases, bags, and accessories to make your next trip seamless. Each suitcase is crafted with features for today's travel needs, making the travel experience less stressful and more convenient. 
Some of the best things I love about my away suitcase is number one, the ease with which I can glide through the airport. Gone are the days of pulling my arms out of their sockets with a bag I have to struggle with through a crowded airport. Away's 360-degree spinner wheels have the smoothest roll and are the easiest to maneuver I've ever had, even when I've overpacked, which is always. And speaking of overpacking, the second feature I love is how much I can get into my Away suitcase. Each comes with an interior organization system that includes a built-in compression pad to help you pack just one more sweater, one more pair of shoes, one more t-shirt. Well, you get the idea. It also has a hidden and removable laundry bag to separate your dirty clothes. Genius! And away suitcases are available in different sizes, colors, and materials, so you'll make sure to love whichever one you choose. But if you change your mind for any reason, you can return any non-personalized item for a full refund. But take it out on the road and try it out first, because each one comes with a 100-day trial. You can return it any time up until 100 days and receive a full refund, and that's a promise. Start your 100-day trial and shop the entire Away lineup of travel essentials, including their best-selling suitcases, at awaytravel.com slash once. That's awaytravel.com slash once. And thanks for supporting the show. January 28, 1954, Robert Garrow, now 17, enlisted in the Air Force. He was sent to Sampson Air Force Base in Geneva, New York. After completing basic training, he was transferred to Florida. But the other airmen teased him for bedwetting, a lifelong habit he had kept a secret until then. In a similar pattern to his childhood behavior, he lashed out physically to these taunts and was reprimanded for fighting. Robert stole money from his sergeant and was caught. He was court-martialed and sentenced to six months in a Florida military prison. He attempted to escape and was caught and sent to a more secure military prison in Georgia. An extra year for the escape attempt was tacked on to his sentence. After his release, he was discharged. He had served only two years in the military and spent most of his time behind bars. In 1955, 18-year-old Robert Garrow returned to New York. He once again lived with his sister Florence, now living in Albany. He worked various jobs at Railway Express, Fort Orange Press, Donut Land, a florist shop, and Hot Shops restaurant. He also worked in construction and as an electrician's assistant. But Garrow could never hold on to a job for very long as he responded negatively and sometimes violently to being placed under the authority of others. In April 1956, Robert was fired from the restaurant and his last paycheck was withheld. He broke into the building after hours and ransacked the place. He tried to break into the safe but failed. He was arrested and charged with third-degree burglary and attempted grand larceny. It was after this arrest that Garrow was given a psychiatric examination by Dr. Walter Ozinski, the county commissioner of mental health. Dr. Ozinski's report concluded that Garrow was immature, unstable, and had no direction for his future. It further stated, quote, he's not psychotic, but he's extremely shallow, cold, and insensitive, end quote. He said Garrow was unable to conform to society's standards and acted out impulsively when under stress. He also diagnosed Garrow as lacking empathy for others. Garrow pled guilty to attempted grand larceny. He received a suspended sentence and was placed under probation. On June 20, 1956, Robert left Albany without informing his probation officer. He secured a job driving a tractor trailer for a traveling carnival. When that job ended, he followed in his father's footsteps and became a mine worker, before finally moving on to construction work. While working in Lowville, north of Syracuse, he met his future wife Edith at a dance. On January 16, 1957, while on a lunch date with Edith, sheriff's deputies walked into the restaurant and arrested Garrow for petty larceny. Albany County had issued a bench warrant for violating his probation by leaving Albany. He was locked up in the Albany County Jail to await his court date. A month later, he was sentenced to probation and sternly warned by the judge not to miss any more appointments with his probation officer. This time, he complied. Edith then moved to Albany to live with him. It seemed Garrow might finally be turning his life around. Robert and Edith married on June 23, 1957 in a private ceremony at the Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church. Garrow was 21 and Edith 18. Released from probation in 1957, Robert and his bride settled in Albany. Their daughter Michelle was born in 1958, 
and Robert Jr. in 1959. By all appearances, Garrow remained a law-abiding family man for the next three years. But after his arrest for his murderous crime spree, he would be suspected of other unsolved crimes that occurred in the area during that time. In December 1959, the body of a young pregnant woman was found lying in a ditch near the Albany airport. Ruth Whitman had been beaten to death. Oddly, two police officers at first had believed the dead woman to be Edith Garrow, Robert's wife. He was questioned about the murder because of the mistaken identity. Ruth Whitman's death is still unsolved. In 1960, Garrow was arrested and charged with second-degree grand larceny for the theft of a camera, accessories, and a stapling machine from the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Office. He was released on probation. The district attorney later reduced the charge to petty larceny after Garrow returned the stolen items. He was given a one-year suspended sentence with no supervision. Just eight months later, he would commit the first in what would become a series of violent sexual crimes. Robert Garrow, now a married father of two, began acting out on the violent sexual fantasies he'd been harboring for years. In December 1961, he snuck up on a couple and attacked them. Garrow later confessed, quote, She was in a car. She was naked with a guy on top of her, and I opened the door, telling them I was a park patrol or something and so forth. I had intercourse with her, too, end quote. Garrow's confessions would stick to a pattern of him minimizing his crimes, and trying to find ways to justify his actions. In this instance, he would describe his actions not as rape, but as, quote, intercourse. He also implies that the woman was willing or had the violent act brought upon herself, saying, quote, I had intercourse with her too, i.e., just like her boyfriend had. His attack on the couple was much more violent than his description of events. He first hit the young man with the butt of a pellet gun, knocking him out before raping the girl. Garrow was arrested and charged with first-degree rape. In 1962, Garrow, now 26, was found guilty and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. He was ordered to serve his sentence at Clinton State Prison, better known as Danamora. Danamora is considered a dumping ground for New York's worst inmates. He would only serve seven years of his sentence before being paroled in 1968. The parole board approved his release, stating that Garrow had been a model inmate who was successfully rehabilitated. Garrow participated in sex with other inmates at Denimora, which he described as consensual. After his release from prison, Garrow also claimed he entered into a sexual relationship with a male attorney. According to Garrow, he was forced to participate in sexual sadism by this unnamed man. Quote, I had a good build, husky build, Garrow said, and he started taking pictures of me in his basement cellar. Then it got down to where we got out in the woods. He used to take pictures and used to have me play with him, etc. and so forth. I was against it, you know. I had scars all over my back from a whip, end quote. After his release in 1968, Robert and Edith rented an apartment at 713 North Salina Street in Albany. He was hired as a millwright at the Millbrook Baking Company. While he claims he lived a quiet law-abiding life during this time, he would later be suspected of several rapes that occurred in the area. Investigators would later believe that Garrow would hunt young women after getting off work. These women would be dragged into the dense woods that surrounded most of the towns between his home and workplace and brutally raped. On December 20, 1971, Garrow purchased a home in a working-class neighborhood located at 109 Berwyn Avenue in Syracuse. He dedicated hours to home improvements and to his neighbors, appeared to be a loving father and hard worker. His daughter's boyfriend, Steve Davis, later told author Jim Tracy, Every neighbor has some kind of baggage like in any neighborhood, but not the Garrows. They were like the family in the television show Happy Days. In 1972, Garrow was arrested once more. This time he attacked two college girls, tied them up, and assaulted them. He was charged with unlawful imprisonment and drug violations. The women, however, did not want to testify at trial, so declined to press charges. The matter was dropped. Later that year, he would attack two more students. Garrow kidnapped Syracuse University sophomores Lenny Garner and Karen Lutz. The couple had been out dancing to celebrate Karen's birthday. The two were very happy in their relationship, but Karen was keeping Lenny a secret from her parents, 
who would disapprove of Lenny because he was black. At 11.30 p.m., they headed back to their dorm, planning to hitchhike a ride back to the campus. The first car they saw pulled over for them, but Lenny had a bad feeling when the man offered them a ride. He told the driver they had changed their minds and decided to walk. The car sped off into the night, and once it was out of sight, they attempted to flag down another car. A few minutes later, a man driving an orange sports car pulled over and rolled down his window. The driver was Robert Garrow. Lenny had felt trepidation with the first driver, but somehow didn't register that accepting the second ride offered was a much more dangerous proposition. Karen got in the back seat, and Lenny slid into the passenger side. He tried to make small talk with Garrow, but other than claiming he was a teacher, the driver stayed mostly silent. He began driving towards the campus, but suddenly swung the car into an empty parking lot. It was still a bit of a walk to their dorm, but Karen and Lenny figured they'd just thank the driver and walk the rest of the way. Lenny turned to thank the driver. Garrow had pulled out a gun and was now pointing it at him. He ordered the couple to stay put. Lenny said they didn't have any money. Garrow responded that he and his friends didn't approve of black men dating white girls and said they were going to, quote, fix him. Lenny, who had a bag of marijuana on him, dropped it on the floorboards of Garrow's car. Although his motive for doing this is unclear, it would later prove to be useful. Lenny and Karen looked around anxiously for these friends to arrive, but no one came. They realized the man was acting alone, and if they worked together, they might survive. Garrow ordered Karen to tie up Lenny, saying that if she didn't make the bindings tight enough, he'd blow her boyfriend's head off. Karen skillfully tied the knots in such a way that Lenny could rotate his wrists one way and then loosen them. They looked tight enough to fool Garrow that she was complying with his demand. Garrow then tied up Karen. While doing so, he began telling them how he, quote, fooled everyone for years. He continued to threaten Lenny if he resisted, saying he'd blow his brains out. You're not getting out of this before I teach you a lesson, Garrow said. While Garrow was busy tying up Karen, Lenny managed to loosen his restraints. He then unbuckled the seatbelt. When the seatbelt alarm went off, Karen reached out and smacked the side of Garrow's head with her hand as hard as she could. Lenny, using his shoulder, pushed Garrow hard into the car door. Garrow's attitude immediately changed and he became submissive. He promised to let them go. Lenny moved his body off of Garrow, opened the door and jumped out, pulling Karen along with him. Garrow sped off, but not before they were able to commit his license plate number to memory. They flagged down help and were driven by a good Samaritan to the campus police station where they filed a report. Garrow returned home and tried to appear calm and relaxed. The police tracked him down at his address and the couple was driven there by police. When police arrived at 109 Berwyn Avenue, Garrow's son answered the door. Garrow came to the door and, upon questioning, said he'd been home all night. The officers asked his permission to look around, and he readily agreed. In the garage, they found Garrow's car, which matched the description given by the students. The hood of the car was still warm, although Garrow claimed he hadn't driven it in several hours. Karen and Lenny came to the door, and upon hearing Garrow's voice, recognized him as their kidnapper. His car was searched, and the bag of marijuana dropped by Lenny was found. Garrow was arrested and charged with drug possession and unlawful imprisonment. As traumatic as the events of that night were for the young couple, they would have no idea, until much later, that they just escaped a serial killer. The following year, Robert Garrow would go on a murder spree, the likes of which had never been experienced in the once serene Adirondacks. That will do it for part one. Next week on Once Upon a Crime, we'll pick up in 1973, when in the course of just two and a half weeks, Robert Garrow's crime spree in the Adirondacks will shift into overdrive. He'll commit a series of kidnappings, rapes, and murders before disappearing into almost 10,000 miles of wilderness. You won't want to miss how this story ends. So make sure you subscribe or follow Once Upon a Crime on your favorite podcast app or listen on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Also on our website, you'll find links to all our social media channels. Once Upon a Crime is now on TikTok. Check out some of our first videos, including a new ongoing series of short true crime tales called What the Crime? Look for us on TikTok at OUAC Pod and make sure to hit follow. Next week, I'll be in London on Podcast Row at CrimeCon UK. Come out and say hi. 
There will be tons of awesome presentations by true crime authors, investigators, documentary filmmakers, and of course, true crime podcasters. It's going to be a blast. I'll be doing a live show on Sunday with Dr. Shoham Das, host of A Psych for Sore Minds. Make sure to add our session to your schedule, and I'll see you there. If you don't have tickets and are going to be in the area, you can still get them at crimecon.co.uk and use my offer code onceupon21 for 10% off your registration. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Special thanks to Lorena Garcia for the final sound mix of this week's episode and Olivia Leaf for helping with the research and writing. Until next time, be good to one another.